The Volcker Rule may finally be here. Does that mean doom for the big banks? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It is Tuesday. I'm Matt Kopenheffer, and right here next to me is David Hansen. Hello. David. <laughs> Hello, David. <laughs> Lady Gaga, David, is going to be starting her next tour May 4th. It's right around the corner. Mm -hmm. How many tickets are you going to be buying? Did you not get my email? I, I didn't. I'm taking the entire summer off. I'm becoming a stagehand for Lady Gaga. I'll be backstage Stage. at all of them. You're going to be ro roadieing for Lady oh, Gaga? Oh, roadie, yeah. <laughs> that, I put it on your calendar. You must not got it. Have you gotten your outfits already? Yeah, yeah. I think you'll look really good in those Lady Gaga outfits. Yes, the shoes. I feel, I feel bad for the, for the listeners of the show who aren't going to be able to see as you... Br I'll bring them onto the show. I'll wear the outfits. But the listeners won't be able to see that. We'll have to tweet pictures tweet of you. Perfect. Right. On to the headlines. First headline of the day, going to Bloomberg. Vocal rules said... Set for December 10th approval by regulators. I don't think we need much introduction here. This is the Volcker Rule. We've been hearing about this for years now. Maybe finally getting put in place, David, to sell everything, right? <laughs> to sell every, every bank stock that we own. Yes, that's what needs to happen. Uh, so it's supposed to be finalized, I guess, next week, and the rules are supposed to come into place July 2014 parentheses, subject to extensions, AKA. We're probably gonna see extensions to the rules here, but the banks are already out in front of this. This is from Goldman Sachs. This is the language they had in their filings. The firm continues to manage its existing funds, taking into account the transition periods under the Volcker rule. So they're already doing this stuff. They've already wound down private equity investments. They've already wound down hedge fund investments. And on this, they say, the firm's aggregate net revenues from its investments in hedge funds and private equity funds were not material to the overall revenue from 1999 to 2013. So this wasn't even that big of a business for Goldman Sachs, who we see as the poster child for the Volcker Rule stuff. So they're already handling it. It's not that big of a deal for them. Impact, yes, likely to be minimal. Uh, although the Bloomberg article did say that there may have been some changes in there thanks to the JP Morgan mm. whale trading mess, uh, maybe some shifts in there to try to prevent something like that again. I, you know, the, the bottom line is, and not to, not to go off on one of my rants, but the bottom line is, is that when you look back at the financial crisis and look at what really caused it, this proprietary trading, uh, gambling bank assets right. that, that are going to put depositors' money at risk, that really wasn't that big of a contributor. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's only a concern if you're, you know, sitting at home, playing the home game, don't really, have, don't really follow banks and are like, oh, yeah, banks, they, they gamble. They just gamble. They the just time. gamble. Yeah, and, and another thing on Goldman, they already shut down their prop macro trading desk. So they've already shut it down, even though the rule's not even in place. So. No more gambling. It's not that big of a deal. Let's go to the second headline. All right, second headline. All worked up here. No more gambling. This one's from... The Wall Street Journal tally of U.S. banks sink to record low. So we've seen banks merge or close over the last couple of years. Meanwhile, deposits continue to build uh, atop the biggest banks there. Yesterday, we talked about a bank being started for the first time since 2010. Bird in hand. Bird in hand bank. Are there just going to be no more banks started again? Or is this, we're still in just the cyclical, nobody wants to start a bank right now. What, right. what do you think? I mean, if there's there's a chart with that Wall Street Journal article. If you mm -hmm. look at that chart, it's kind of like, yeah, maybe uh, maybe we won't see. Oh, yeah, there's there's that chart up there. For the, for the listeners, basically, we're looking back to 1984, and it's been a pretty steady drop-off in the number of banks, even as deposits have steadily climbed. Here's the way I think about it, is that it's it's a matter of of gaining a fit and, and a big a big impact for this was a change in interstate banking laws. So you right. could have these big national banks, and so as the, the 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 banks spread out to be nationwide banks, you get more efficiencies. You get banks that are able to gather up and and have more deposits and more business under one roof. Barnes and Noble and Borders coming in hurt a lot of independent small booksellers. You, mm -hmm. you see a lot fewer. Uh, independent mom and pop bookshops now. Uh, then Amazon came along, and, it, and you know it's it's got its nationwide uh, digital uh, footprint, and uh, and it hurt folks like Barnes and Noble and Borders and all of the independent booksellers. It, it's a similar thing in the banking business where you had all of these lots and lots, thousands, literally thousands of mm -hmm. small banks, 
And then you had uh, regional banks that kind of uh, started to hurt them. And then you had interstate banking laws change. You've got these national banks now. And they're just, in a lot of ways, they're more efficient. Yeah, and we, we haven't seen a lot of startup banks now, but I don't think we're never going to again. Oh, no, no, no. I think the cycle no. will return. Sure. Will the banks look like they used to in terms of big brick and mortar come into the banks, that's how you do business? I don't think they'll look like that. The new startups, I think, will look probably more like Bank of Internet or ING Direct, which was only online, which is now under Capital One. So I think there will be banks that come back and people mm -hmm. start banks. Maybe it's harder today with the regulations, but they're just going to look a lot different. And I think that's probably a good thing for consumers to, to have uh, an easier interface, perhaps, and maybe a good thing for opportunistic investors. Well, and, and I think you could still see banks like Bird and Hand that are going to come to the market and, and want Very to serve, specialized. Yeah, serve a particular constituency and have sort of a moat from, from mm -hmm. that perspective. Certainly right now, with uh, spreads the way that they are, it doesn't make a lot of sense to right. open up a, a new bank because you're not going to make a whole lot of money doing it. There you go. Third headline, going back to Bloomberg. J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Capital Plans, Clear Fed Review. This is the 2013 uh, capital review just in time. A month before this. Year. Just in time <laughs> to be able to launch into the 2014 yes. uh, capital planning process. If uh, viewers and listeners recall the, uh, w when the capital plans came out, the Fed didn't object to uh, Goldman and JP Morgan's plans. Right. They just said, Ah, we're not crazy about your planning process. You got to kind of get that uh, under control. So they, they did that. Uh, they got a better process in place now. And maybe shareholders can feel better going into the 2014 planning process that they just got, th they're, they're now on the same page as yeah. the Fed just as they go into 2014. So You would hope so. I mean, if they're just talking about this a month so. before they're submitting right. it, I would hope they'd be like, Hey, well, here's our resubmission, and how do our how does our next submission look? I right, hope it looks right, okay. Right. But yeah, I think dividends and buybacks will continue to be a, a bigger story with these banks. I think they, they still gotta be. I think they still have good upside from just a price perspective here. But if we just get back to these banks paying more dividends, I think that'll be a really good thing for shareholders. There's so much capital in these banks. I, I think there's got to be more uh, buybacks and dividends at some mm -hmm. point, some point soon. Uh, our focus for the day: we have an ask a fool question. Uh, this came from our, uh, from our Facebook page. The, the question comes from Paolo Anderson from Turin, Italy, all the way from Turin, Italy. If the Fed tapers soon, which stocks are most suited to endure the onslaught? Paolo asks, would you recommend value with buyback program, health and utilities, or dollar-denominated stocks for people who live outside the U.S.? So, David, this onslaught, you know, I... The first, thing, the first thing that I think of when I hear this question is there's this assumption that there will be an onslaught. So I, I think the first thing we got to do is step back and say, will there be an onslaught? And so what I did is I went back and I looked at QE2. QE2, I quantitated the second round of quantitative easing that the, the Fed did, ended June 30th of 2011. Mm -hmm. So if we look back to there, and actually, did, did we get my chart in there? We can throw we it got, in. We got, it. Yeah, we got it. Okay. We'll throw, we'll throw it in after. We'll throw it in after. So June 30th, 2011, the 10-year Treasury was at 3.18%. 3.18% at the end of QE2. Mm -hmm. So if we were thinking that, that rates rise after the end of quantitative easing, the Fed's no longer buying, we expect rates are going to rise. What happened? Reasonable, Ye right. year later, 10 years, the 10-year Treasury, 1.61%. So from 3.18% to 1.61%, the exact opposite happened, and to a very large extent. Mm -hmm. So then we look, at, look ahead to QE3, so the third round of quantitative easing, this one that we're, we're talking about coming to an end here, the purchases of the mortgage bonds. A month before QE3, the 10-year was at 1.65%. So as the Fed starts buying, the thought would be, okay, rates are going to go down. Six months after QE3 started, the 10-year was at 2.04%. So it was higher. Mm -hmm. And the most recent 10-year rate was 2.81%. So even higher. So we've had, and this, this is actually repeated through all the rounds of quantitative right. easing, where when the Fed has been buying, when uh, QE has been uh, in effect, rates have been uh, have been rising, mm -hmm. and then when, when QE goes away, rates, uh, rates fall again. So, so it's kind of a weird situation. So when we think about, oh, it's obvious that rates are going to rise when QE goes away, it's not that obvious. 
So I, I don't know that we're going to see this onslaught, except to the extent that I think a lot of people have already made up their minds about this mm -hmm. and say, well, when QE ends, it's a bad thing, so and I'm going to sell, sell stocks. Right. And so stocks will be sold just because people think stocks should be sold. Right. And, and like, like interest rates and like the economy as a whole, it's very hard to understand what's going to happen and say, if this happens, this is going to happen. X is directly related to Y and interest rates. We like to think that the Fed completely controls that, and if they do this, it goes up on the other end. Mm -hmm. But there's a bunch of other factors that are rolled into kind of the market here, if we just want to call it this big, scary entity. It's kind of, what's the economy doing? What's the outlook of investors here? It's not just what the Fed decides to do. And we've seen that in the history. So the first part of his question, I guess our answer is, we don't know if there's going to be an onslaught. Maybe there is. Maybe there's not. I think it's it could go either way. So I think I don't think that's the answer that he wants. I don't think that's the answer he wants, <laughs> but I think that's the right answer. The right answer is you don't know, and I think it gets dangerous when you try to position your portfolio one way or another because you think they're going to taper, rates are going to go up, these stocks are going to fall. I think that gets gets a little dicey saying that. So I don't know if that so, answers this question. Well, well, well wait, why I think the I think the expectation is I mean if you think in terms of specific stocks the expectation would be okay rates are going to rise so you think about mortgage rates so mm -hmm. so particularly agency mortgage rates you're taking away all this fed bond bond buying uh, Annaly Capital American Capital Agency would be in big trouble but if we see a repeat of, of, the, of what we've seen before when QE goes away and rates fall, that could actually be good for them. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the banking sector, you know, Wells Fargo out there leading the mortgage market, if rates fall, that could actually revitalize the refi market that's been hurting as rates rise. I'm not saying that that will mm -hmm. happen, but I'm just saying if we see a repeat of what happens when QE has gone away before. Um, but but I, I, that to me, that's market time. And that's trying to predict yeah. what the giant bond market is going to do, which is a combination of, of reality and, and economic, what makes economic sense, and psychology. And combine those two and trying to predict that is a nightmare. So again, not to have just a boring answer here, but I'd go back to, you want to own companies that you believe in the management and you think have good competitive advantage and you want to own for a long period of time. You don't try to say, what am I going to do because of the end of QE3? Mm -hmm. You say, what companies do I want to own? Yeah. And again, it's, it's a boring answer. I'm sure that's not what Paula wanted to hear. Mm -hmm. He wanted to hear how to play this situation. Right. But that's, here at The Motley Fool, uh, we just don't invest that way. And I think some people could argue, okay, this is how you play it, and maybe their scenario works out for them, but I think there's a but large... Because they were right, right, or because they were... I think there's going to be a large degree of luck either way here if you try to say, I'm going to buy these companies because they're, they're positioned well for higher sure. rates. It could maybe happen, and then you could say, oh, I was so right there. But I think it could also not happen, and you could get a little bit on the unlucky side. So I think there's a balancing act, and I agree with you. I'm, yeah, of course you do. Well, why wouldn't you agree? Paula can let us know if that was not sufficient. He can he can yell at us. Yeah, he can tweet. It, we we he, he, feel free to tweet us at TMF Financials or email us mm -hmm. uh, WTMI at fool.com. Speaking of our email address, again WTMI at fool.com, we've got our mailbag. This is a question that came directly to us through that email address. This question is from Larry Dunn. Larry writes, I've been listening to the show for a few weeks, but have yet to hear you mention the words credit union, despite the fact that there were around 94 million credit union members in the U.S. at the end of 2011. My experience with credit unions as a member has been fantastic, while my experience with banks as a customer has generally been very bad. In light of the recent threat by banks to start charging their customer, customers for depositing money, my question is this. Why would anyone do their banking with Citibank or Bank of America when they'd be treated, to so, much be when they'd be treated so much better, get better CD rates, lower checking fees, lower overdraft fees, et cetera, at their local credit union? And I don't buy any answer referencing availability of branches around the country. My credit union is a member of the shared branch network with over 5,000 locations around the world. It's a long question. Indeed. David. Good question, though. Why? 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 Larry says why. So why? So I guess we're attacking that he's asking from an individual's perspective, why would, they, why would they go to Bank of America? I guess some reasons could be better technology. Perhaps you have bill pay with Bank of America that a lot of people use to make their personal finances a lot easier. You can get a credit card with the bank. You can have your deposits, your credit card, your investment account, all with one. It's hard to get that at a credit union. Uh, You're going to get some angry emails from, from credit unions and customers it, because very you, can, you can in a lot of credit unions. Right, you, you can, but and a lot of people, they don't want to leave their bank. They're already with their bank. There are people that are upset with the bank, mm -hmm. but 
they can leave if they want to. Banks, they don't hold you hostage. You can go to a credit union. And I'm sure we'll also get comments saying, there's a penalty if I leave, but I don't know if that's, I don't know if there is. I mean, maybe there are. I've switched so, banks before. So, so, so you can leave, but I think you can, you can point to the technology, having everything in one place. Maybe you're happy with the rate you're getting. And to answer this question from the bank's perspective, not all of their deposits, not all of their customers are just retail customers like you and I. If we look at Bank of America, which is the one he asked about, I'll give you some numbers real quick. So they have about a trillion dollars in deposits. Mm -hmm. Only around 10% of those are from retail customers. And what they brand as retail is they have less than $50,000 with the bank. So only 10% of their deposits are from kind of the, the Joe Schmo um, part of the world there. You're referring to me. You're a Joe Schmo. 25% <laughs> um, are from, from their preferred segment, which are these are the people that have have money with with Merrill Lynch, have credit cards, have over fifty thousand. They get treated well. They get treated well. Uh, so if we think about it from the bank's perspective, not a ton of their customers from a deposits perspective, numbers wise, they have a lot, but from the actual deposits on their books, frankly, it's not a huge part. You no, know, frankly, thinking about that, I, I don't know that credit unions want a lot of the customers that hate banking at the big banks because a lot of the customers that hate banking at the big banks are not profitable customers. So if you push those over to the credit unions, they suddenly have a lot more unprofitable customers. And we're not saying Larry's unprofitable. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, no. I'm not, saying, <laughs> I'm not saying Larry is, but, I, but I'm saying a lot of the people who are at big banks right now who are sticking with them and saying, ah, I hate Bank of America. This is terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, go over to credit unions and bring them unprofitable business. But that's, that's maybe another matter. I'm going to give a little bit more of a cynical answer <laughs> than you on why people are with the big banks versus the credit unions. I think a big part of it is, the, is marketing. Big, big banks have a lot more money, a lot more heft. They have national marketing campaigns. They have their name plastered all over major stadiums. sporting events, stadiums. People are familiar with the brands. I mean, it's like you, you go to, uh, you, you go to a, a rest stop off of a highway and you see the McDonald's sign. Is McDonald's the best food out there? Is it the best food at that stop? Mm -hmm. Probably not, but you know that McDonald's logo and you know what you're gonna get in there. Kind of similar to a, a Bank of America, I mean, Maybe not the, the best service and the best customer experience around, but when you go to a different town, particularly for people who move uh, within their lifetimes, they go to a new city, oh, there's Bank of America. I mm -hmm. kind of know what to expect. There's right. Citigroup. Um, and on a similar note, presentation. I mean, if you go to, and, and, and I hate to knock the, the credit unions because there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with them. I think they offer a really good service to a lot of customers. But you go to a lot of the credit union websites and it's like, Oh, hello, 2001 website. It, and you go, to, you go to Huntington Bank's website or you go to U.S. Bank's website or you go to Bank of America's website. And these are, are really slick, great presentation. Um, and, and so I think customers maybe feel better about that. It's mm -hmm. maybe the, the comparison of, of shopping at a, a Marshall's versus shopping at a Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm not saying... I like and again. I bet you do. Um, I mean, maybe it's not a great comparison because at Nordstrom, yeah. you actually get really good customer service at Bank of America, not so yeah, much. Maybe. But in terms of the presentation, um, finally, I'll just point out that not all of the big banks get terrible customer service ratings. While Bank of America and Citigroup, I was looking at the J.D. Power uh, 2013 customer uh, ratings. Mm -hmm. Bank of America and Citigroup pretty much across the country got, got relatively low ratings. But Chase... That's J.P. Morgan's bank. Chase got very high ratings. In fact, I think it was the Midwest was the top-rated bank. Um, and then in, in, in PNC, in the markets that it served, pretty consistently got very high ratings. So um, not necessarily all big banks are getting bad ratings. And I, I said that was my last point. Actually, my last point <laughs> is you do also have to ask particular people why or why not they'd go with a, a bank versus a credit union. For somebody like me, for instance, uh, my wife and I have moved around a lot. And so it's not necessarily as easy to do the credit union thing when you're constantly changing mm -hmm. the city where you live. But if you have a national bank, then you go. Right. And like you said, maybe there's a network of credit unions, but it's just one more hurdle that you have to, to do. It's if, not if as if seamless. Move. Yeah. I mean, if you have Bank of America, and it's, you know it's the same Bank of America. And it's an easy transition there. So, so it's, it's different for different people. But I do think marketing plays a big, big role in it. Maybe well, I'll it. tell you what. People can email us and tell us why they chose a credit union over yeah. a bank or vice versa, WTMI. And, and why, why we're terrible people for talking about big banks over credit unions. Especially you. Oh, and, and to Larry's point, the reason that we, we, we haven't mentioned credit unions a lot on the show, you can't invest in credit unions. And so at the end of the day, this is a show about banks and financials. Mm -hmm. but it's a show about investing. So 
that's a big part of the reason why we don't talk a lot about credit unions. That was long-winded. Yes. Let's go on to the game. The <laughs> game for today, Would You Rather. This is, we've, we've got two scenarios here. For each one, we're going to say what we'd rather do. First one, David, would you rather drink two weak old expired milk or invest $5,000 in American Capital Agency? Wah, wah. Oh, man. Two weak expired milk. You know I'm going with American Capital Agency right now. I know you're not the biggest fan of them, and we actually answered a question a couple of weeks ago as to why you aren't a huge fan. And that person listening who owns shares of American Capital Agency is probably saying, two-week expired milk, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> the stock is cheap right now for good reasons, still trading at a 20% discount to, to book. And I know the outlook doesn't look great now, but it, it has been a good performer. Uh, I think they're starting to take the right approach now. I think they're being a little bit more conservative. I think that's the right move. Maybe not the best management team in the world, but I think they're starting to look at it the right way. Big discount to book. I would much rather take my risk with the five thousand dollars than getting food poisoning. I am going to go with the two week expired oh, milk. I'm gonna I'm gonna drink that up, and I'm gonna hang on to my five thousand dollars. And I'm not gonna hate on American Capital Agency. And I'm not even gonna say like you just said that maybe not the best management. I may be wrong about American Capital Agency's management team. Their approach has not been my favorite. I, so in this situation, I'd rather drink that milk, hang on to my $5,000, put it into a, a mortgage REIT if I have to invest in mortgage REITs that I, that I like better, like Two Harbors or like perhaps Annaly Capital. That wasn't part of the scenario, but we'll go to the next one. Wait, what do you mean that wasn't? I, I can there do wasn't that. A, there wasn't a caveat to go to another mortgage REIT. What do you mean? I can drink the milk. I drink the milk. I keep the $5,000. I put it wherever I want. All right, next scenario is, would you rather get a $100 today or the gains or losses on $1,000 of Bank of America stock over the next five years? What would you rather do? I'm taking the gains, gains or losses on Bank of America stock. I think, I, I, I think I've got a much better opportunity to collect a good deal more than that $100 over the next five years than I do for taking that $100 right now. I think it's a tougher scenario than you made it out to be. But I'm gonna agree with you. I think you take take the. I think you can get a better than ten percent. Take your hundred dollars. You don't. You have to agree with me. Take your hundred dollars. Go home. I'm gonna agree with you. I know it's hard for me to do, but I agree <laughs> with you. A ten percent return over a five year period. That'd be pretty poor returns on an annualized perspective over five years. But assuming I couldn't invest the the ten thousand dollars, you have to take the ten thousand dollars cash. You can't do anything with it. It's one thousand dollars, David. Let's no, not the ten thousand dollars. The ten ten dollars, hundred dollars. <laughs> Hundred dollars today, and not reinvest them. You want all my money? I'm taking Bank of America. That's all you need to know. Okay, Bank of America it is. <laughs> well, that was that was interesting. <laughs> Let's finish it off on a strong note. Twitter sphere, David. What's our first tweet? Somewhat oh, strong. Wait, wait, wait. Let me just say before we start this, TMF at TMF Financials. That's our Twitter handle. Tweeted us. We love getting tweets. Yes. Okay. First tweet. Now get done. I- I'm done. Uh, this is from at Plan Maestri says U.S. banks, the legal tab, and we have a picture. This was from a Wall Street Journal article, I believe. And yes. for those of you listening, Bank of America at $45 billion legal tab. The next closest, J.P. Morgan Chase, $26 billion. Wells Fargo, $9 billion. Citibank, only $4 billion. That is what jumped out at me, too. Citigroup, $4.33 billion versus Wells Fargo at $9.3 billion. Wells Fargo quietly has, has racked up more than twice the legal fees and settlements as Citigroup. So as a Citigroup shareholder, does that make you nervous that are we just haven't like met our maker here and we're kind of just going to get hit eventually or how do you feel about that or do you feel better that they just I'm, maybe I'm, I'm a little position? I'm a little bit nervous but the company just the, the bank just doesn't have the presence and wasn't doing the same things that Bank of America and and uh, JP Morgan were doing let alone uh, or or Wells Fargo and in particular a, a lot of the settlements that came from Bank of America there and we talked about this a little mm-hmm. bit yesterday came from Countrywide right. not Bank of America's core business okay Second tweet, we've got Bespoke Investment, that's at Bespoke Invest. Uh, Bespoke writes, regardless of sales, Ford has been dead money for five months now. A lot of back and forth between $16 and $18. David, our pal Morgan Housel sent this tweet over to me this morning. I don't like to rag on Bespoke because I really like most of what they're doing, but I hate the talk of dead money. Like this idea of dead money that just because something for a few months has not moved to a huge upside that you shouldn't own it because it's not going anywhere. I agree. Are it's you, a good term, though. Kind of sounds cool. 
It, it sounds cool. <laughs> sounds cool, doesn't? It's not helpful. It's not good though. Are are you are you worried about like uh, like J P Morgan being dead money? No, because a lot of things that seem like dead money, those are the people that they get so anxious. And they're like, oh, it's not going anywhere. I just got to get out. But if we're investing for five years, why do you care about a three month period anyway? About investing for twenty years. Oh, it's a long time. <sighs> All a right, long finishing time. off with the last tweet of the day. This is from at K Eight Hall. She says, just sold off my free student ticket for 100 bucks. Does this count as arbitrage? Oh, yeah. It does? Yeah, of course. I had a question, though. It, I, it's not arbitrage if there was a time lapse between it, because there was some risk in there in terms of they could have canceled <laughs> the game from when she got the ticket. But she made the agreement before. It's a free student ticket. OK. I was just trying to be contrary to you. I, I know you were. You're always just trying. You're always just trying. Impressive. To I wonder what ticket. That, I wonder what game that is. Though. I think it. I think it's Baylor. Isn't she in? Te I think. I think she's in Texas. It might be Baylor. Are they playing someone good? I don't know. I think they lost. I thought they lost already. Anyway, hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. There you go. You can have that <laughs> nothing, or nothing wrong with that. The gains from Bank of America gains over the next five years. <laughs> or some sour milk. Yeah, one of the two. All right, that's our show for today. You can email us, WTMI at fool.com. You can tweet us at TMF Financials. I am Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. We'll be back tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.